In 1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for the Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on tactics. All right, so we've been going through the book of Daniel, and I think it's been really enriching. So just to get you up to speed on what's going on in the story right now, Daniel is going to interpret the dream. And we saw that he goes to the king and tells him exactly where his power comes from, that it's God doing the interpreting, and God sent him the dream in the first place, and so God is the only one that can translate it, and he's going to be the medium by which God is going to make known to him the interpretation of this dream. So I really wish that we could go into the little intricacies and details of each of these prophecies, but unfortunately, we don't really have time to do that. That particular study is so in-depth, it's not really conducive to the chaplain's report because it's so short and it's brief and and I tend to not go that deep into the scripture. Uh, Be it said, if you do, I'm sure you can find books on it that goes into some of the historical events and and how they line up with the things that Daniel portrays. But the long and short of it is the dream is about a statue and the statue has different parts of it made by different materials. And each part of it represents a different kingdom that is going to occur throughout history. The current one, the one that exists now in the story, is Babylon. And so that's the head, and then you go further down, there's another part that represents Greece, and then Rome, and then the kingdom of heaven. So those are the kingdoms that we're, we're seeing about, Babylon, Greece, Rome, and then the kingdom of heaven, which will be established by Jesus Christ. So what's interesting about the last kingdom and the symbolism in it, is the last kingdom is the stone that crushes the others and it becomes a mountain that winds up filling the entire earth. And what's significant about that is that this part that represents the kingdom of heaven, notice that it was never part of the statue. You see, Babylon is the head and then you have Greece as being the the arms and the breast and then Rome being the legs. But when you're talking about the kingdom of heaven, It's just a big rock that was never a part of the statue in the first place. And I think that says something to the role and the way that the kingdom of heaven is supposed to operate. Of course, that being the church, uh, the church that Christ gave his life for the church that Christ bought with his own blood. And so because of that, this is a very different kingdom than every other one. It's not even part of the statue. It just comes in from somewhere else, which signifies that it is not meant to be a kingdom that is established here on earth that it is a spiritual kingdom that Jesus Christ himself is the head of. It's not like all the other kingdoms, and it serves a very different purpose. So that being said, let's go ahead and jump into the scripture and sort of dissect this to a degree. In Daniel 2, 44 through 45, In the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed, and that kingdom will not be left to another people. It will crush and put an end to all these kingdoms but it will itself endure forever. Insomuch as you have uh, as you have saw the stone that was cut out of the mountain without hands, that it was crushed the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God has made it known to the king what will take place in the future, so that the dream is true and its interpretation is trustworthy. So this is Daniel really breaking down the dream and what it means and why it's significant to King Nebuchadnezzar. So in this prophecy and the way that he describes it and and brings it out, I want you to note that not after, but during the days of those kings, this kingdom will be established. So he's saying all these other ones, Greece and then Rome, that kingdom is going to basically go away or be absorbed by the next kingdom that comes along. However, it talks about this last kingdom, the kingdom of heaven, in a very different way. It says that it will happen during the days of those kings. So in other words, it's not going to be the force that once the kingdom is established, the other kingdoms go away, like the other ones. This is going to be a very different kingdom that operates within the confines of the days of Rome. 
because he says in the days of those kings, that is when this kingdom is going to be established. And that lines up perfectly with the kingdom of heaven being established by Jesus Christ. And he also says that this one will never be destroyed and never be conquered. So unlike the other kingdoms that all are there for a time and they wind up getting conquered or they go by the wayside or collapse from within, whatever else happens, this is a kingdom that is very different because it is going to endure forever and nobody will ever be able to conquer it. Nobody will ever be able to make it go away. It is going to last throughout eternity. Not even the destruction of the earth itself can end this kingdom. That's what Daniel is saying here. It is going to crush these kingdoms and endure forever. And if you know the history of Rome, you'll note that Christianity is largely what had a, an effect on the, the worst parts of Rome and, and sort of pointed it out and some of the persecutions that came from Christianity. I mean, it's fascinating history, and I do encourage you to look at it yourself. But Christianity was in part sort of a catalyst that allowed the Roman Empire to fall, and so there's some truth to that as well. So I want you to notice this as well. Why is the stone uncut? Why does this big rock come and crush this apparently man-made graven image of all these different metals coming together to make this big man? See, that's really symbolic. Because if you know the Old Testament, you know that it was against the law of Moses to ever build an altar to God made out of cut stone. You couldn't make one out of bricks. You couldn't make one out of stones that you would cut to fit together. That was blasphemy. That would defile an altar. And you know who did that? Pagans. Pagans made altars out of brick. Pagans cut their stones before they made it into an altar. Not so with God. You had to make an altar out of stone that you found. You had to be able to work and piece it together and to be able to make an altar to give sacrifice to God. It is the only way that God would accept sacrifice in the Old Testament. And there's a number of reasons why that's significant, but we won't get into it today because it's beyond the scope of our study. However, it's symbolic that the kingdom of heaven is an uncut stone. You see, it destroys all the illusions of gods and paganism and the images that mankind has created. Even though it is an uncut stone, it's a blunt object, it's not something that's carved or anything like that. See, an uncut stone is one that is shaped by the hand of God, not by humankind. God, whether it's by a very personal way or through nature or however you want to think of it, an uncut stone is one that is shaped by God. And so because of it, it becomes the force that destroys the man-made image of this statue that is being talked about, just like the kingdom of heaven is what destroys this false image, this false God of self-indulgence or whatever else it is that we put first in our life ahead of God. It is the kingdom of God that was purchased by the blood of his son that destroys that. Because Jesus is not of mankind. He is a man, and he was born of a woman. But Jesus is not a creation of man. He is part of the Godhead, and so his kingdom is not going to be like other kingdoms that were established by human beings. There is a great internal truth of the scripture right here, because it is important to keep in mind this book of Daniel happened over 500 years before the birth of Christ, and yet everything in this prophecy lines up perfectly. No human could have possibly come up with that. No human could have wireworked all of these events to just happen to coincide to where it would fit every description given by the book of Daniel. And if anything, that is a testament to the way that God constantly is about 18,000 steps ahead of everybody else because he can see the results of this world. It's part of his divine wisdom. And he is revealing to Daniel and King Nebuchadnezzar his plan for the salvation of the world to establish his kingdom here on earth that will endure for all of eternity. Stay the course, friends. This is normally the part of the video where I tell you to go ahead and like and subscribe, but the truth is, I really don't care whether you do or not. I mean, it's not like you really need all the latest news and commentary from me. It's not like there's a lot of really important stuff going on in the world and in the state of Alabama right now that you should probably be aware of. So, you know what? Like and subscribe. Or don't. I don't really care. Reverse psychology. Boom.